You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My brain has a really hard time switching off at night, so I really like to listen to calming things before I go to bed. And I've been listening to something called Calm History, which is a podcast that is exactly as cool as it sounds. If you want to learn about fascinating moments in history in the most relaxing way possible, then try the podcast Calm History history. Each episode is narrated in a very soothing voice to help you relax or fall asleep. The host, Harris, has one of those voices that is so soothing and it's a delight to listen to. You're going to feel like you're in a cozy little bookstore with a fireplace going while a friendly professor talks to you. You'll learn about famous explorers, leaders, inventions, civilizations, and ancient wonders. There is even a six-part series about the Titanic. Just search on your favorite podcast player for Calm History or use the link in the show notes for podfollow.com slash calm history for all of your calming, relaxing history episodes. Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, weird history, and hell. (laughs) Once again, we are going to hell, dear one. Uh, This episode for this week was supposed to be a birthday special with dad history, but unfortunately he is still not feeling quite hundred percent. We thought that he was going to be feeling good. Um, history dad had open heart surgery about two and a half months now, I think. And he's doing good. He's, he's okay. He's fine. Everything's good. He's just still not a hundred percent. And so we're postponing the episode, the birthday special episode to September, um, when I will actually physically be in the States and recording and everything will be a lot easier. So that's what we are going to do. And so by popular demand today, we are going back to hell to explore the single most metal hell on the face of the planet and in any dimension okay this this hell makes the lakes of fire look like a kiddie pool in the summertime hades and all of them absolutely not they wish they wish that they could be as horrible and awful (laughs) as Buddhist hell is. But before we get into the ins and outs of the eternal suffering your soul will be facing at the hands of the beastly hell wardens, we must get on with our housekeeping. Housekeeping waits for no one, not even hell. So first on the docket is our meetup in Boise, Idaho and San Francisco. So there is a Google Docs form that is linked in the show notes below. We will be meeting in Boise, Idaho on the 14th of September and we'll be meeting in San Francisco on the 1. 8th. Yes, the 28th. We'll be meeting on the 28th. And if you would like to come and have a little history hangout, please go ahead and fill out that Google form. The Google form will be closed. I do believe I'm going to make the cutoff on September 5th. So you have until September 5th to um, sign up for the Google Meet. No, to sign up for the, the meetup using Google form. Oh, geez. I would absolutely love to see you in Boise or San Francisco. It would be super, super fun. We'll just have a casual meet and greet. We'll do some stuff. We'll hang out. It's going to be really exciting. Next on the docket is the app, the For the Love of History app. If you are new here, if this is your first episode, welcome. We are raising money to create a For the Love of History app, an app that will accompany the podcast episodes. There'll be some quiz questions. There'll be some history scavenger hunts, hydration check-ins, all sorts of fun activities that we'll do on the app that will connect to 
the episodes. So if you would like to donate, that would be absolutely wonderful. All donations, uh, all people who donate will be able to help with the beta testing of the app and get some special bonuses. So if you would like to, or you're able to, there is a link in the description box below for that. And our final order of business is you have one more week to order the limited edition Ted t-shirt. Look at this. It's Ted as a Maneki Neko and it's very cute. And it says, for the love of history, it's very discreet, very demure. We're very mindful of our love for history and our love for Ted, our official, unofficial mascot. So you can get that up until August 30th and it'll be gone. Gone forever into the void. And speaking of the void, I do believe our housekeeping is over and it is time to take our sinful little souls down to the gates of hell and go see Enma, the hell king. So grab a glass of water because it's the last one that you will ever get, at least for a few millennia. And let's get to it. The first thing you notice is the heat. In all your years on earth, you have never been this hot or this thirsty. You open up your dry eyes and before you is the most horrendous scene you have ever had the misfortune to look upon. Demons with the head of ox and the bodies of over steroided men run amok chasing what looks to be humans. All manner of weapons are flying about indiscriminately slicing and stabbing. As you try to catch your breath, you become aware of the stench, like a million rotting corpses, finding its way into your nose, your eyes, and your mouth. A huge black mirror stands in front of you, but you can see nothing. As you look to your left and your right, two severed heads stare daggers into you, and it feels as if they can see into your very soul. And at that moment, a voice that sounds more like a chorus of tortured screams erupts inside your head. It says, you have died and been found wanting. The prayers of your family have been insufficient and you have failed the four tests. Now you will lay bare your sins before me and all of Jigoku. The mirror that was once an inky black sea comes to life and plays every sin that you have ever committed. The time you ate meat, when you accidentally burned down a pagoda and a host of monks that lay inside, when you watered down that guy's drink at the bar because he was too drunk and loud. And some of these sins may seem small and benign and quite oddly specific. But down here in Jigoku, there are 62,000 separate hells for every sin known to humanity. Even the sin of crushing a turtle in between two tiles. They've got a hell for that. After all of your sins have been laid bare for the gaggle of bureaucratic demons that govern Jigoku, the Red Lord Enma himself sentences you. The same cacophonous voice rings out and an ox head demon slings a noose around your neck, dragging you to the hell of great and terrible suffering. But don't worry, in a hundred days, you can come back and petition the God of hell again. And maybe your family will have prayed enough to lessen your sentence. This is the scene that meets every soul that fails the four initial tests of Japanese Buddhism after shedding their mortal coil. And you would be right to think that this sounds incredibly violent for a religion that is so centered on peace. But the Japanese flavor of Buddhism is much, much different from its cousins in the Near East. Tibetan and Indian Buddhism are entirely different. All of them stem from the same belief of the Buddha, but Japanese Buddhism took on a life of its own like many things do in the isolation of the Japanese archipelago. The key difference between Japanese Buddhism and the rest of the world is the acceptance and even promotion of violence in the pursuit of enlightenment. That is one of the reasons why Japanese Buddhist hell is so much more grotesque. 
But what's more, in the original Tibetan and Indian forms of Buddhism, there is no heaven or hell. So what happened? How did we go from no hell to the most extreme hell ever? Buddhism in Japan is almost like the telephone game. Originally, Buddhism came to China in the Han period between 206 BCE and 220 CE. It mixed with indigenous religions and took on a flavor of its own where a hell was developed. Then it made its way to Korea. And in either 538 or 552, Mahayana Buddhism was introduced to Japan from Korea as part of a diplomatic mission. The Japanese royalty at the time were pretty split on this new fandangled religion, but the common people absolutely like, nope, no thank you. We have our Shinto gods. We're good to go. And that was partly by choice and partly by design because fancy elites like to gatekeep new stuff. So it stayed a religion for them for a few hundred years until Kobodaishi, Kukai, if you're nasty, came back from his studying in China in the year 806 and was like, hey, let's let the common people uh, have enlightenment, guys. Don't be all gaslight gatekeep girl boss, everybody should have access to the Buddha. Then taking this idea, he popped his little pious butt all over Japan, spreading the word, and he also spent a considerable amount of time here in Shikoku, the island where I live. And in fact, there is something called the Hachiju Hakkasho, which is the 88 temple pilgrimage. And it is, I think, one of the only circular pil pilgrimages in the world. And there's 88 temples that Kukai apparently went to, and you can go and you can have a, a pilgrimy good time. <laughs> but I digress. After Kukai, Buddhism spread all over and the bald man of enlightenment found its way into all aspects of life. Since Kukai, 13 major sects of Buddhism have formed in Japan and they can be as different as Catholicism is to Southern Baptistery. But the one thing the majority of them have in common is the belief in Jigoku, Buddhist hell. In Christianity, there was little information on what hell was like until Dante and his Inferno. But 300 years before this epic adventure to the center of hell, a monk named Genshin took it upon himself to write the fanfic of all fanfics that would form the basis of how people saw Buddhist hell in Japan. This book is called the Ojo Yoshu, the Essentials of Rebirth. Genshin introduced us to a host of characters who exacted the divine justice of the great Buddha. At the top, we have King Enmao and his many bureaucrats that kept the Ten Kings of Hell in line. Then we have the countless Hell Wardens ruled by the two head guards, the ox-headed Gozu and the horse-headed Mezu. And finally, we have Emba, the enormous bird that flies, the putrid skies of Hell, exacting justice on particularly black-hearted individuals. Now, there are a bunch of other side characters, but these, these are the arcanon characters for the time being. Genshin wrote in excruciating detail about the eight levels of Hell and their accompaniment 16 bonus hells. And that, dear one, is what we will be talking about today. A few weeks ago, we talked about Shinto hell and how chill it was. And if you haven't already, please go check out that episode. It's really good. It's linked in the description. And today we are going to dive into a very not chill hell, the opposite of chill. Zero chill, not a chill to be found. And honestly, it's kind of gross. Buddhist hell is gross. And Dante's Inferno is going to sound like a children's bedtime story after this episode. So let us now travel to hell. How do we get there in the first place? Well, first, you have to kick the bucket. <laughs> then your family sits with your body for several days, sending prayers and checking to make sure that you're actually dead. If their prayers aren't enough, you get sent to hell for various trials in front of the Ten Kings of Hell. These trials are spaced out and there are a lot of them, so there will be more information in the show notes if you'd like to know more, but for our purposes today, just know that there's a lot of trials spaced out over a long time. And if you fail all of these various trials, you are put in front of the king of hell. 
Enma. To his right is a woman's severed head, and to his left is a man's. This is Marume and Kagyu Hana. Marume, the woman, can see into your soul and perceive all of your secret faults, the ones you may not have acted on but for sure thought about. Kagyu Hana, on the other hand, can see every misdeed that you have ever done, even when you thought no one was looking. Kagyu Hana was. All of these things are put on display on a gigantic mirror, and after you watch the play-by-play -play of all the sins you have ever committed or thought about in your life, the bureaucrats of hell crunch the numbers, because even in hell, Japan has to have a complicated and convoluted system of governmental red tape, and if you have never you have never had the misfortune of dealing with the Japanese government stuff. You are so lucky and I am envious of you. Maybe someday I'll do a story time of how difficult it was to get married here in Japan and do literally everything that everything that has to do with the government because <laughs> it is horrendous and that horrendosity extends into Japanese Buddhist hell. So after all this bureaucracy is over with, you are sentenced to one of the 16 hells. There are eight hot hells and there are eight cold hells. And today we'll be focusing on the hot ones because there's more information on them. But just to give you a little sample of some of the hells, in the cold hells, they include the hell of burst blisters, the hell of limitations, and the hell of clenched teeth. Just know that it is extremely, extremely cold and terrible, awful things happen to you because of that coldness. Just because it is not fire does not mean it is better. The hot hells are the most present in Japanese Buddhism, and they have garnered the most, shall we say, infamy. So without further ado, dear one, let us go to hell. What sins should send you to hell? Murder? Yes. Theft? Sure. Adultery? All right. Killing a deer? Well, how about watering down alcohol and selling it? Hold on, hold on there. Uh, how about being a bad lawyer and suffocating a sheep with fire? What? How weirdly specific. What are we talking about here? How many times are people killing sheep with fire back in the day? It was this like an epidemic of sheep murderers? I have no idea. But although these hells are incredibly specific, they are real life sins that have their separate hells. And they were all written down in the essentials of rebirth. As we discussed earlier, there are eight main hot hells and each one has 16 minor hells. And they're all stacked on top of each other like a horrifying layered cake. Each hell has a very creative name, sarcasm, that describes almost exactly what happens in these abominable pits. First, we have the hell of revival. Then we have the hell of black rope, the hell of assembly, the hell of lamentation, the hell of great lamentation, the hell of scorching heat, the hell of great scorching heat, creativity off the charts. And finally, at the very bottom, we have the hell of uninterrupted suffering. These hells are very much like different dimensions with time moving at different paces the further you go down. For example, one year in the hell of the revival equals 10 million. 666,666 Earth years. While time in the bottom layer of hell moves so slowly that human math has not advanced far enough to express the number of Earth years that it would take for one year in the uninterrupted suffering hell. So while you are technically not in hell forever, I feel that several trillion years is a very long time. So who goes to what hell? The first several layers of hell deal mostly with your run-of-the-mill sins, like the hell of revival, where destruction of life of any kind will land you at least 100 days of haunting your fellow 
hellmates while wearing iron claws and going all Wolverine on one another until you are reduced to ribbons of flesh. But don't you worry, this hell is called the hell of revival for a reason, because as soon as a cold wind blows, you are dismembered bits, pull a Frankenstein's monster and come back together to start the process over and over again. The accompanying layers of hell all have to do with taking some sort of life. Like in the hell of the revolving sword, where you go if you destroy life with a covetous heart, and your punishment is running through a forest of trees that are actually swords, a la Game of Thrones. <laughs> then you have the hell of filth, where if you are eating something, might I suggest you pause for a moment. Okay, here we go. Um, where you are forced to eat hot poo-poo and and there are worms with metal beaks that swim in the hot poo-poo and they crawl in and out of your body sucking out the marrow in your bones and do you know what sin will get you a one-way ticket to the hell of filth killing a deer killing killing a deer i feel like killing a deer and then being forced to eat caca and get devoured by worms for several thousand million years is not that's, that doesn't seem like a natural punishment i see no link towards the two but hey who am i not the buddha so what do i know <laughs> and unfortunately for the overwhelming majority of us, we are going to find ourselves in the hell of the fiery cauldron where we are going to be boiled eternally for cooking and or killing slash eating animals. So great. Love that. But for us, you know, this is pretty good because as far as the hells go, these are pretty tame. They're standard torture, fire, all that jazz, with the exception of the of the of the poo-poo eating, that's that's a little bit, that's a bit much, okay, if, if we're being honest. But it pales in comparison to the next few layers of hell that really, they're really the overachievers of torture and agony. The third layer of hell is called the hell of assembly, which is reserved for murderers, thieves, and adulterers. The punishment is very unique and quite creative and something that I feel needs to be made into a movie. And if there are any writers of scary stories or writer like screenwriters for horror films and you need assistance in the spooky department and checking for historical accuracy of your horror film, please feel free to email me because I would love to consult you in the inner workings of Buddhist hell. <laughs> but I digress. The third level of hell is a smorgasbord of atrocities, okay? First, you have the ox head and the horse head guards that are running amok and forcing the souls of those who had committed the previous crimes to run through iron mountains. Imagine like if Mount Everest was made of iron and then 10 of those were lined up two by two. That is what is in this hell. Then these hell wardens force the adulterers and the murderers and the criminals to run through these mountains that begin to move back and forth. They swing and sway back and forth until physics takes its inevitable course and they collide together. The mountains collide, crashing into one another and the unfortunate souls running through the valley turn into human hell jelly, but only for the shortest amount of time because they are almost instantaneously brought back to life by the voices of the hell wardens crying out, revive, revive revive. And after these hell wardens feel that you have been thoroughly smushed enough, they will lead you into another valley of fresh horrors. To your left, you will see trees made of razor blades with handsome men and beautiful women at the top. Scrambling up these trees, you will see lustful cretins unable to stop themselves from climbing up 
this trunk of razor blades only to be disappointed when the object of their desire is somehow now at the bottom of the tree. These poor unfortunate souls will climb up and down, up and down these razor blade trees until they are reduced to nothing more than piles of flesh. But that's not all, dear one. To your right, there will be an enormous iron mortar and pestle wielded by a beastly giant, busy at work, making more hell human jelly. And finally, to your absolute horror, there is a lake of molten copper filled with the undying corpses of your fellow hellmates. With each meaningless stroke in the pond, their skin melts off and blisters until finally they can swim no more. But don't worry, They'll come back to life at the edge of the pond only to jump back in and the pattern will repeat and repeat and repeat for a casual 1.6 trillion earth years. In the next two layers of hell, the hell of lamentation and the hell of great lamentation, we have a motley crew of murderers, thieves, drunkards, and people who use evil language. They are subjected to all sorts of torture that fit their crimes, such as cutting out their tongues, nailing their mouth shut, plucking out their eyeballs, being roasted on a spit and having molten copper. I don't know what it is about molten copper, but it's used all the time, very liberally used in hell. And that molten copper is poured down their mouths. All the while, the wardens of hell are screaming scripture and various Buddhist sutras to drive home the fact that these sinners are the only ones responsible for their 6.8 quadrillion years of suffering that is ahead of them. But not everything is awful and horrible, dear one. There is one thing that I absolutely love about these last few hells. There are very specific hells for people who commit crimes against women, which is in stark contrast to the hells that we'll talk about later on in this episode. In hell number four, there is a hell of cloud fire and mist that is specifically reserved for men who force women to drink alcohol and then take advantage of them. These awful pieces of human garbage are crushed by the feet of hell wardens and then brought back to life for a very, very long time. And hell number seven is even better. In hell number seven, the great scorching heat with and hell number seven is even better. Hell number seven is the great scorching heat, which has fields and fields of fire that makes earth fire feel like the softest, sweetest snow. And if you're a person who violates and takes advantage of a nun or any woman in any way, the offender is dragged down to hell via a rope around the neck and tortured by the Lord and my himself. And if I could just put my ballot in for what hell I would like to be real, it's these ones. It's these hells. And I will gladly take one for the team if I can have a guarantee in writing by Lord and my himself that the garbage humans that hurt, violate, and just do general garbage human things to women will, you know, be tortured and squished and just generally have a terrible, terrible time for trillions of years. But, you know, I'm not condoning violence. I'm just, I'm just saying that I'm not against it in very specific situations. But I digress. Another bonus thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that in hell number seven, there are 16 bonus hells and the majority of them are specifically places for punishment for men who have done terrible things to women. So shout out to the feminist ally king enma of hell we love him we stand him he's great i think he's gonna go into the um the canon of for the love of history right along sobek sobek we love lord of hell enma feminist icon (laughs) so the final level of hell is the hell of uninterrupted suffering and this is for the worst of the worst the people who commit the five crimes which are murder of the mother father, a saint, 
or they draw blood of a Buddha and or they create a schism in the monastic community, which is spoiler alert happened like 13 times at least in Japanese history, in addition to people who deny the law of karma and those who receive alms, but they make no return. If a person is found guilty of these crimes, a chain is placed around their neck and they are flung down to the bottom of Jigoku, which takes 2,000 years. They spend 2,000 years listening to the lamentations of countless souls trapped in seemingly unending torment. As each layer passes by, the anticipation of their upcoming torture builds and builds as it gets hotter and hotter. And when they finally reach the eighth layer of hell, they are greeted by an unimaginably high black wall. These walls are organized in seven concentric squares with increasingly horrendous atrocities awaiting them. Iron nets of fire line the first corridor. Massive hell hounds with eyes of lightning and teeth of swords loom in every corner, waiting to attack with their iron tongues and flames that erupt from every pore. As the sinner makes their way through the maze, they suffer eight trillion kinds of pain while they are in utter darkness. And the cherry on the top of this diabolical Sunday is an undescribable stench that would kill all on earth if it were ever to escape the bowels of Jigoku. This stench fills your nose, your mouth, your eyes, and it makes it impossible for you to breathe as you stumble your way through to the center of the maze. And according to the Essentials of Rebirth by Genshin, only one one thousandth of the horrors of this hell have been described because to even speak or hear the true nature of the hell of uninterrupted suffering would cause the speaker and the listener to vomit blood and die. And thus ends the eight hells according to Genshin. But though we have made it into the belly of the beast, dear one, our journey through hell is not yet over. Do you find it hard to sleep at night? Then the Sleep Cove podcast can help you. Hi, I'm Christopher Fitton, the voice and clinical hypnotherapist behind Sleep Cove. Sleep Cove features sleep hypnosis, meditations and and bedtime stories, all designed to help those of you who struggle at night to achieve a restful and peaceful night's sleep. Search for Sleep Cove on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and see why Sleep Cove helps millions of people sleep deeply all night long. Hi, I'm Neil. And I'm Lauren. And we're both moderately successful trivia podcasters. You co-host Triviality, and I co-host Misinformation, a trivia podcast. But we decided to get together to make our own podcast, Curated by Chance. Because we both love to talk about the topics we know a lot about. I'm an art curator who also teaches art history to engineers. And I'm a filmmaker and author who loves movies. But Lauren hasn't seen a lot of movies. You're telling me you seriously have never seen North by Northwest or The Devil Wears Prada? What's that? And Neil doesn't know a thing about art. So every week we use three random prompts from our trusty algorithm Chance, designed by a NASA scientist. The Great Curator. That will help us come up with weekly topics to tell each other about, whether it be an artwork, a movie, a book, a pop culture event, a Broadway show, or even a TV show for dads, like Bosch. So listen in every week to join us, two good friends with generalized anxiety disorder who aren't going to apologize for excitedly talking about the things we love for the first time in our lives. They made a TV show about Hieronymus Bosch? Not the one you're thinking of. Rivers of blood, but not just any blood. The blood that comes from bringing life into the world. And in that blood lives countless iron-beaked worms that bury their grotesque bodies in and out of bones and suck out marrow. Forced labor, the likes of digging up bamboo shoots with a candle wick from frozen earth and being trampled on by demons. This is the hell that awaits women who menstruate and those who die in childbirth. This is a stark 
difference between the hells that we just heard about. So what is going on? In our episode on the history of Satan, we learned about the apocryphal texts of the Bible, stories that didn't quite fit the narrative or directly contradicted other aspects of the canonized Bible. Well, Christianity is not the only religion with apocryphal texts. Buddhism also has them. The sutras are the sacred texts of Buddhism, and sometime in the early 13th century, the Blood Bowl Sutra was created in China. The Blood Bowl Sutra is not an official Mahayana Sutra, but it caught on in China and about a century later made its way to Japan. Previously in Japan, there had been some belief that women who died in childbirth would go to hell, but this Blood Sutra took it to a whole new awful, terrible level. In the Japanese Journal of Religious Studies from 1983, Dr. Momoko Takemi gives us incredible insight into the ins and outs of the Blood Bowl Sutra, which in Japanese is known as the Ketsubon Kyo. I've linked this journal article in the show notes below if you want to read it all because it's incredibly fascinating. We don't have enough time to talk about it all. But in this journal article, she says that there are 16 different versions of the sutra found in Japan, and she thankfully translates one version for us, and I will read it to you now. Once the Buddha took 1,250 biscuits into the middle of the deer park. At that time, the venerable Mokureng put the following question to the Buddha. Once I went to such and such a prefecture and saw in the middle of a large field there a hell composed of a pond of menstruation blood. This pond was some 84,000 jujana wide, and in the middle, women who were wearing handcuffs and ankle chains were undergoing hardships. The demon who was the lord of this hell came here three times a day and forced the women sinners to drink the polluted blood. If they refused to do so, he would beat them with an iron rod. Their screams of anguish could be heard from great distances away, and the sight of this made me very sad. And so I asked the Lord of Hell why the women were being forced to undergo such hardships. He replied that the blood the women had shed during birth of their children had polluted the deity of the earth. And furthermore, when they washed their polluted garments in the river, that water was gathered up by a number of virtuous men and women and used to make tea to serve holy men. Because of these acts of uncleanliness, the women were now forced to undergo sufferings. Cool. Thus, Mukuren used his holy powers to come to the seat of the Buddha and to inform him of what he had seen with his eyes. He asked then what he needed to do for the women to be saved from their punishments in the pond of blood. We stand Mukuren. Mukuren is a feminist icon. The Buddha then answered, teaching Mukuren how to save the women. He said it would be necessary for them to respect the three treasures of filial piety, to call upon Mukuren, to hold a blood pool liberation service and to hold a blood pool feast, to read sutras, to have an esoteric ceremony, then to make a boat and float it off. At that time, a five-colored lotus flower would appear in the middle of the blood pond, and then he said all of the women sinners would be saved and reborn in the Buddha's land. First of all, Buddha, what is going on under your watch, my friend? How are you allowing this to happen? Gross. Hate that. Also, Mokuren, we stand. We love you. You are great. Thank you so much for noticing this giant pool of menstruation blood and being like, you know what? Not cool. Not cool at all. <laughs> Anyways, what on Sobek's sweaty earth is going on here? How do we go from hells specific to punishing men who take advantage of women to punishing menstruation and childbirth? Birch? I can't even speak. I'm so upset right now. Childbirth, which are natural things that happen. They happen. Newsflash. Menstruation happens. Okay. Oh, this makes me so mad. And you're going to get mad too, because it all boils down to religious schisms and good old fashioned misogyny. Although the Blood Sutra was created in China during the 13th century, it didn't really gain popularity in Japan until the Edo period, which was from 1603 to 1868. During this time, the emperor had lost power. The shogun was in charge, which meant that the that Japan was a, like a feudal military state, and it was one, one it was run 
by a scary warrior guy um, with various samurai clans. And during this time, Confucian ideology had made its insidious little way to Japan and it completely changed the structure of the Edo period household. Before this time, women were able to own property. They could get married. They could keep their last names. They could be the heads of households. They could do whatever they want. They were powerful. They were equals. But since Confucian came to town, all of that changed. Women were now inferior. Menstruation was now icky, gross, gross. And if you died in childbirth, you were terrible and you weren't a woman. And why can't you just do your job? Because that's like what you're made to do, right? Right. Anyways, things really took off for the Blood Bowl Sutra and these hells specifically for women in the 17 and 1800s. And lots of additional texts were created to explain why women had to suffer so much more. In the Kaie Rakuso Tan Ketsubon Kyo Ushitsu Enyo no Sui Shu, which is an incredibly long name for a terrible, terrible thing. In English, we would say the random stories about the Buddhist ceremonies, the origin and the transmission of the Ketsubon. Ketsu Bonkyo was published in, between 1801 and 1803 and, ex, and it explains why women are just so weak and they must suffer. And this is what one of the excerpts say, okay? It says that because women were born as women, their aspirations to the Buddhahood are weak and their jealousy and evil character are strong. The sins compounded become menstrual blood. What the fuck are you talking about? Which flows in two streams each month, polluting not only the earth god, but all the other deities as well. Thus, after their death, they will certainly fall into this hell where they will undergo unlimited suffering. Well, let me get this straight. Okay, let me get this straight. Men menstrual blood is compounded sin. That's what that's what that is. Okay, Aristotle, Jesus. But it goes on. This isn't the only text, unfortunately. There is a text called the Yu Koku Yoin, which was published in 1821. And it says in a section entitled The Origin of the Ketsubon Kyo, quote, all women, even those who are the children of high families, <laughs> have no faith and conduct no practices, but rather have strong feelings of avarice and jealousy. These sins are thus compounded and become menstrual blood. Again, and every month it flows out, polluting the god of the earth in addition to the spirit of the mountains and the rivers. In retribution for this, women are condemned to the blood pool hell. Cool. Love that for us. Thank you so much. And if we could take it back for a second, does this sound familiar to you? Does this sound a little bit like our very first episode of the season when we're talking about Satan? Does this sound like the absolute garbage human Aristotle floating around in my brain right now? Does this also sound like hysteria when a bunch of episodes ago? Because for me, this is very much giving Aristotle and I hate that. Hate that guy so much. Thankfully, this Blood Hell Sutra bullshit was not a part of the mainstream Buddhist hells and has since completely disappeared. It was gone in the 80s when our good Judy Momoko wrote her paper, so thanks Sobek for that. It really disappeared after the Edo period into the Meiji area, so the end of the 1800s. But unfortunately for us, dear one, although the hell of menstrual blood is gone, the rest of the eight hells are very much still here. And we should probably start our redemptive chanting if we plan on not languishing in the various pits of Buddhist hell. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thought. And my final thought is a bit of a recommendation for you. I could not show all of the images of the various scrolls and panels and woodblock prints of hell for monetization purposes on YouTube because they are gross. And also, I don't want to traumatize anybody because... I will not lie to you. Some of these images 
are nasty. They're gr- they're they're re- it's a lot. Like I was in the library um, here, and there's a big book called Hell. It's just called Hell, and it's on the various scrolls and images of Buddhist hell. And I was a bit disturbed. I was glad that there was a bunch of people around me because these images are scary. If I was home alone, I don't know if I'd be able to read this book by myself. Some of these images are absolutely horrific. And if Japan is good at one thing, it's good at horror. While I was doing my research, I came across this incredible resource created by the Japan National Institute for Cultural Heritage. And they have created an e-museum that has the vast majority, if not all of the national treasures and important cultural properties scanned in high resolution so that you can view them, all of them for free on this website. And I lost my hit when I discovered it because you can see all of these things like you can see them more closely than you can see them in the museum. Like if you go to the museum, a lot of these have glass cases over them or you have to stand a f- certain distance away, but these you can zoom all the way up and you can see like the fabric patterns on some of these scrolls. On the, They have fabric, they have like clothing, they have like kimono stuff. So anybody, this is good for anybody. If you're looking for inspiration, if you're looking for resources for teaching, if you're looking for homeschool stuff, if you just want to see some cool shit, like check out this website because it is really, really cool. And the last thing I want to tell you about in the final thought I will not be showing it because it's gross, but if you want to go see it, you can see it. It's linked below. There is, uh, when I was doing my research, I found this kimono that um, is in line with something called the vanity laws. So in Edo period, late Edo period Japan, the merchants were getting really, really rich and the samurai were not. And so they made these things called vanity laws where the merchant class weren't able to wear certain things or have certain like fancy stuff on their clothes. So the merchant class found like really subversive, sneaky ways to get around these vanity laws and they would paint things on the inside of their kimonos. And one image that was found inside of a merchant's kimono was this absolutely horrendous image of one of the Buddhist hells. And it's, it's, It's a lot. It's beautiful because the artwork is beautifully done. The image is not. The image is horrible. And if you want to see it, you can go look at it. But I just thought it was really cool. So anyways, gross vanity, (laughs) abiding kimono and also e-museum. Go check that out. I'm so serious about that e-museum. It's it's really, really stinking cool. Well, dear one, that is all she wrote for today. This is actually my second take of the outro because I had to wait for 30 minutes because my camera died. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me for this extra special birthday episode. I'm so excited to get to turn 32. 32? It's crazy. So wild banana sandwich, but I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy that you spent this time with me. Thank you so much. Uh, Your support means the absolute world to me, honestly. It really does. Um, I am able to do this because that because you're here. So thank you. Thank you for supporting me. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can leave a rating or a review or both. We are still trying to reach our 200 reviews goal. We are so close to being there. Like we said at the beginning of the episode, if you want to support the app, there is information for that down below. If you would like to be twinsies with me and get yourself a limited edition Ted shirt, it's so cute, so adorable love it. There's all sorts of Ted designs. There's all sorts of ghosty designs. We've got some Yude. We've got some yokai. We've got our BFF, the Kappa. You can get (laughs) all sorts of cool stuff over there. All the designs are made by yours truly, except for this design. This design is made by our good Judy Addy Miyako, and she is a fantastic artist. So go check out her work, which will be linked below. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go I'm going to have a sweet little treat because it's my birthday weekend and I deserve it. All right. I love you so much. Go do something nice for yourself. 
treat yourself to a little sweet treat. Drink your water, go outside, touch some grass, snuggle an animal consensually. Again, I have Ted down here. She's about to yay, join us. Did I say take a drink of water? I think I did. But just in case, drink your water again. And I will see you next week when we actually talk about the warrior queen of Zenobia, because I messed that up in last week. All right. I'll see you later. Love you. Bye. Goodbye. 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 (laughs) Why is there a metronome right now? Okay. (laughs) Hello, dear listener, and welcome to Conflicted, a podcast that tells stories of the Islamic past and present to help you make sense of the world today. Hosted by me, Thomas Small, author and filmmaker, and my good friend, Eamon Dean, an ex-Al-Qaeda jihadi turned MI6 spy, Conflicted is prepping its fifth season, which is coming to you very soon. And in the meantime, you can sign up to our Conflicted community. Subscribe to Conflicted wherever you get your podcasts.